Okay, so you, uh, you got two handouts today. Uh, first one is exercise um, 115, which we'll do. And it, it looks like I made a mistake and I posted 215 on your exercises online. I have to switch. I miscategorized. Uh, and you also got your assignment 104, which is the Charlie Harper drawing. Um, you're more than welcome to do a Google search of Charlie Harper to kind of get a sense for what's going on. But next Monday, I'll spend the lecture talking uh, about color theory, but I'll also go through a bunch of Charlie Harper sample slides. And we'll start by picking a, a guideline for your Charlie Harper work. So there's plenty of time to kind of go through that. Um, so anyway, we'll cover that more in a little bit. Uh, it is due on Wednesday the 18th, so a couple weeks out, um, or two weeks from today. So that's there. Just kind of put it in the back of your mind um, as we start moving forward. Today we're going to talk about logo design. And I'll, I, I heard some grumblings earlier that you already did this in 1.30. Um, but that is OK. You now get to use a computer instead of a pencil and paper. So, uh, And hopefully we'll, we'll go through it. And maybe I'll inspire you to do a slight variation on what your first logo design really was. There's obviously, there's a lot to logo design. There's a lot to graphic design. There's a lot to all of these pieces. And in this class, it's not possible for me to go too in depth in any one particular topic. Next class, I'm going to talk about color theory. I could spend the whole semester talking about color theory. I could spend the whole semester talking about logo design. I mean, it's, it's really easy to expand any one of these topics into a much broader discussion. But we're getting an overview in this class, and we're kind of breezing through a bunch of different things. This dovetails really nicely into Illustrator and some of the techniques that I'll show you in Illustrator today, which is part of why we're doing it. An effective logo is fundamentally a distinctive one. It's recognizable. We talk a lot about brand recognition. You recognize a brand via the logo. And I'll show you a bunch of examples today as we go through, and you'll start to get a sense for what I'm talking about. It should be appropriate. No surprise there. It should be practical. It should be graphic in form. Generally, the graphic is what grabs your eye anyway. Uh, it should be generally fairly simple. The more complicated they are, the harder they are to reproduce, the harder they are to be recognizable. Starbucks is a little bit of an exception. We'll show you that one in a little bit. Uh, and it should convey some kind of intended me message, which might just be brand recognition of the particular brand. So I'll throw up here six logos that you guys see every day, or most every day. And they're all pretty darn recognizable. Okay? Shell gas, shell coming from oil deposits. There's the translation. The VW logo, Volkswagen, VW, it shows up in there. NBC, I have no idea what the peacock comes from, but it's traditional NBC. It's always been the peacock. So the peacock shows up. ABC is just a pure text based logo. I mean, this is about as simple as it gets. Uh, Chanel, the Rolling Stones. Etc. All iconic graphic symbols that you see every day, and you recognize those particular brands. Simplicity, easy recognition of the logo. Is it easy to see? Is it easy to spot? Do I know what it is? Question. Uh, Nothing. Right. There you go. There you go. You learn something new every day. I probably could have Googled it ahead of time, but you know, there you go. Good job. Good Google searching, right? Versatile. So can it go in a variety of places? You know, obviously a car logo, I'm showing the Chevy logo here, but let's say it's the Chevy logo or the Tesla logo or whatever. Can it go on the hood ornament of a car? Can it go on the front of a car? Can it go on a billboard? Is it versatile enough to go in multiple places? Does it have something unique or unexpected about it that causes you to be interested in it or that causes you to, to gravitate toward it? So I told you we'd come back to the Starbucks logo. Okay, This is a logo that you probably can't go a day without seeing, certainly if you're in the United States. I don't think you can drive by and not see this logo or you know, see it somewhere in the room over the course of the day. It's become very, very popular. Does this logo have anything to do with coffee? No. It has nothing to do with coffee. Yet, because of its repetition and because of how much we see it, we associate this logo with coffee. It's brand recognition. And that's fundamentally what the logo is about. It's about that brand recognition. I'm going to throw in a bunch of other examples today that aren't real brands, but they're logo designs that, so you don't get overwhelmed with you know, the Shell Gas logo and that sort of thing. 
uh, because sometimes they're just creative. And when you're coming up with your own logo, you can feel free to get a little bit creative about this stuff. I love this one, fish bomb, it's great. Is your logo enduring? Can it survive the test of time? Let's say you're a company and you, you brand yourself, you have a particular logo, is that logo going to go out of fashion? Or is it something that you're not gonna wanna use anymore as you go forward as your career as a company? It does, does it just look old fashioned? Does it not feel right? Think if your company is gonna be around for 10, 20, 50 years, is that logo still going to look right? Okay, example in point. Original Apple computer logo. Yeah, a little different, huh? So let's imagine for a second that instead of the back of your iPhone having the real Apple logo on it, this was on the back of your iPhone. Yeah, it's Newton with the Apple, and I mean, it, you know, it's a good, it's not a bad logo, but if you think about surviving the test of time and the iconic nature of it, if this was on the back of your iPhone, would it feel right? Probably not. Would, the, would Apple computer have resurrected itself when it was about to die? Maybe not. All because of the logo. You don't know. So let's look at Apple as a case study here. There's our original Apple logo. Uh, 1976, they said, wait a minute, that's not going to work for, for the long term. Let's change. And from 1976 to 1998, pretty long tenure, the Apple computer was the rainbow Apple logo. Some of us probably remember this logo. Not everybody. So then Apple was about to die in the late 90s. You guys are aware of this. Steve Jobs came back to the company, resurrected it, and from 1998 to 2000, they took away all the colors and they went back to the, uh, just the black Apple. Okay? Same logo. Then we fast forward 2001 to 2007, we got really shiny. Everything was shiny. So we, we adapted the logo for the tr current trend. It's the same shape, it's the same logo, but we just tweaked it a bit. Then we moved forward into 2007, and we took away some of the shine and some of the blue nature of it, and we went more whitish silver with one little streak of glare on it. Then Johnny Ives came in and said, no, we're going back to flat UI, changing the design, um, and we went to this logo. Could be the reverse, it could be the gray apple on the white background, but it's essentially what we now see as an Apple logo, what is now on the back of all of these devices. So when we initiate the logo design process, we first start with whatever the design brief is. You're a, you're a logo designer, somebody comes to you, right, and says, Stuart, I need a logo. Okay, well, that's good, but what is your company? What do you do? Right? What, how, what, what do you need this logo for? Where is it going to go? So we need to define what is this logo? What am I trying to create? What's it going to be? Who is the intended audience? All of those kinds of questions need to happen in that design brief. Then we move into research. Finally, reference, and I'm going to go through all of these in a little bit more detail. Sketching, conceptualizing, reflection, and then finally the presentation of that particular logo. I like this one too. This is a little Venn diagram with those circles that are overlapping. The biggest section is the sketching and conceptualization phase because that's where you come up with the ideas. That's where you have to figure out what is this logo going to look like. So we go back to the design brief and I jumped ahead a little bit because we started talking about it. You need to question that client about what's the intended purpose? Who's the audience? What am I doing this design for in the first place? In the case of today, Exercise uh, 115, I'm asking you to design a logo for yourself. So guess what? You're questioning yourself. What do I want this logo for? Because it's, it's you. Okay. Be certain to include where it's going to be used. Is this going to go on a t-shirt? Is it going to go on letterhead? Is it going to go on a business card? Is it going to go on a billboard? It might change depending on where it's going to be used. This, if you're doing it for somebody else, it's not a bad time to talk about how much you want to get paid to do this particular piece of work. Now, in the course of today, you can negotiate whatever salary to pay yourself you want. Okay, So you can pay yourself whatever, and that's acceptable. Then we move into research. 
And this is actually kind of fun. You want to research what else is out there, what logos are out there, what looks inter interesting to you. In the case of you, for most of you, you're thinking you're going to be in the architectural field or the design field. So looking at what other companies use as their logos is not a bad place to start. What do other architecture firms use as their logos? They all have logos, so what do they use? Do that kind of research because it's going to help inform you. For, for my industrial designers out there, same thing. You look at industrial design firms, though, instead of architecture firms. What's in the industry? What, what's normal to be used? Do you have a history of previous logos? If you took 130, you did a logo. Do you like that logo, or is it time to jump ship, like the original Apple logo? Do you want to do a modification or, or an adaptation of that logo, or do you want to move forward? What are your competitors using? So what have people done in the past? Did, were you in 130 and you saw somebody else's logo and you said, I really like that? Maybe that helps inform you a little bit. Maybe it's the other way around. You saw somebody else's logo and you didn't like it. Oh, I definitely don't want to go that direction. Depends. Then we want to get into reference. Look at successful logo designs. What makes a successful logo design? We talked a little bit about it already, but what, what brands somebody? What, what is iconic? What, what works long term? What makes them successful? You can do a Google search for logos, and there's hundreds of them. Hundreds of them. What current styles are being used? Is it a flat UI? Is it glossy? Is it shiny? What's trendy right now? And I'm going to show you a bunch of the design trends and logos at the end of the lecture so you can see what's trendy right now. Remember, of course, that will your logo survive the test of time if it's too trendy today? So you have to think about that going forward. Then we move into sketching and conceptualizing. This should be the fun part. This is where you try stuff out. And when you're thinking about a logo design, doing lots and lots of repetition, lots of lots and lots of different things is not a bad place to start. It's easy to do. You've got a computer. You've got layers. Just, just go for it and start to see what, what fits, what looks right. Trust your intuition. This is good. Remember to fall back on your research and reference steps. So you go back and revisit those steps. How's my logo work compared to that reference and research that I've done before? Yeah, I think I'm evolving it into the right design decision. You produce lots and lots of ideas. And then, right here we go through the, the process, design process. Maybe you start with a photograph. There's the initial idea. You do a little sketching over it. Okay, well, we're evolving it into a logo, but it's not that easy, easily reproducible. So maybe we start to see some general shapes in a logo. We start to identify those shapes and clarify it a bit more. We maybe we take it into Illustrator do it a little bit more clean lines, vector graphics. And we end up in the final logo. So you see the process from that initial photograph all the way through into a final logo. And then let's look at, oh, we're adding a little bit more here. Then we start to see it as its final logo. And then here it is in all its forms. Business card, letterhead, how does it fit? How does it look? We're envisioning this across a spectrum of things. Maybe it goes on the logo on a t-shirt or something like that. Logos end up finding their way on these types of items. Another example here, sketching conceptualizing not happening in the computer, but instead happening on a piece of paper. Nothing wrong with a piece of paper and a pencil. Right? I was actually I was at a building inspection yesterday for a, for a project that I'm working on, and we were all sitting in the back of, a, or you know, standing at the back of a truck with the tailgate down. We had the plans out. And we were talking about it was grading and drainage stuff, and uh, the inspector was like, "Oh, you know, I have a couple notes about when you get this this particular thing or when you call for the next inspection." He's like, "Do you have a pencil?" And we all look around at each other. Nope. Nobody has a pen, right? All we had were our phones, so we're writing on notes on our phones and stuff. It was just kind of interesting because that has a tendency to happen. I'm telling that story because there's nothing wrong with a pen and paper. It would have been a good idea for me to have a notebook with me, but of course I didn't, right? So think about that as a way of starting. Sometimes just sketching is a good place to start. Different options here. OK, so the building up of this, once we get into Illustrator, the various curves and how they intersect, then starting to fill it in with these color forms. And in this case, they're obviously going through the rainbow of colors, thinking about is it three-dimensional? Does it have these shadows in the gradient? Is that intentional or not? Playing around with different fonts. We spent a whole lecture on typography. Fonts are critical. 
especially if there's going to be any type in your logo, what feels right. These all look the same on the surface, but which one is the right pick? They're subtly different, and you have to decide. Committing to that decision, and then seeing the whole logo come together. It's also not a bad idea, though, to think about it projected on a black backdrop, projected on a gray backdrop. What about if your logo needs to be in black and white or grayscale? Because you can't afford to put color logos on everything. You need something grayscale. How does this change? And I think this is a really good adaptation into grayscale with just the little white lines along the edge that separates the fronts and the back sides of this swirling form. It's not a bad strategy. So think about what, what, what does it look like in black and white or in gray. Then you move on to reflection. Step away from your work and revisit it. Gain perspective. Ask your neighbors or colleagues for, your, for their opinion. And I actually think built into the handout today, I have to double check this, but I think I put it in there. Yep. Under part three, toward the bottom, it says specifically in your handout, that's how important this is, ask your neighbor, the person sitting next to you, for feedback on your logo. So you can't be quiet today. You can't just like sit there and pretend that you don't know the people around you. Seek somebody out in the class, somebody that sits next to you, and say, what do you think of this? Is it working? Is it not working? How could I improve this? Okay? Design dialogue is always critical. You need to do this to become a better designer. You have to be aware of these kinds of things. And you also have to be able to articulate why somebody's design is better than somebody else's. So it's, it's important to, to, to be able to articulate that. So I'm forcing you to do it today under part three. You have to do it. You get that feedback. You let your ideas mature. You make some tweaks. Maybe you ask for some feedback a second time, maybe a third time, to get better results. I love this one. It's a great one. Grab it. It's got a rabbit in it, too. It's one of those double. The negative space becomes the positive space, depending on which way you look at it. Those kinds of logos are fun. Then you get to the presentation phase. You have to distill those ideas down to whatever the best idea is. And then you need to show that idea to your client. In the case of today, you're showing it to yourself. So it's not that big of a deal. But if you designed it for somebody, there comes a point where you have to present that idea. And you have to tell people why you did this particular idea. And this is why this is the best move for your particular logo. So here I've got the Mall of America as, as a little example here. And I think this is pretty good. We have the standard logo. We have a, a few variants on the same theme of the logo. Then we have color changes that can happen depending on the time of year. Right? So you have you know, the 4th of July color scheme. You have the Christmas or holiday color scheme. You have the all silver color scheme. You have the pink color scheme. Maybe that's Valentine's Day. I don't know. And then you can also see how that same language can become backgrounds for other information. So that logo is extremely versatile in the ways that it can be applied. But they're all the same logo. They're all still recognizable. And I think that's part of what makes this particular one very successful. You also want to learn from other people. What brands succeed and why? Okay, The swoosh. Absolutely iconic logo. There's no text on it, but everybody knows that this is Nike. Now, it helps that it's on shoes, so you see them on a frequent occurrence, kind of like Starbucks. Okay, But it, it's really simple, yet it's withstood the test of time. It hasn't needed to evolve. It hasn't needed to change. It's very, very iconic. Yeah. I think initially, yeah. It's where that shape actually, so maybe they went back to three, you know, they looked back. Well, in the initial design process, probably so. But think about this has been the same symbol. Yeah. I mean, certainly for my whole life, it's been the same symbol. And they've never had to change it. Even the proportions of it haven't changed. That's successful branding. Typography. So we talked a whole lecture on typography. We're coming back to it again here. Critical for some logos, notice that some logos are only text. That's it. And I'll show you text examples in just a second. What is the right font for your particular design or your particular logo? Choosing that is critical. Is that going to go out of fashion or not? All the same things apply. Does the font reflect the, the business that you're in? Is it appropriate for that particular business? 
uh, you might have to make your own. You might have to draw your own. Maybe that's appropriate. A lot of the fonts that I'll show you on the next page didn't exist before the people created the font for the logo, and then they existed after that. Um, remember to load your custom fonts like we did last class. Go find a font that you like, load it in, use that font if you want to. Uh, the little details matter, the kerning, the tracking, the spacing, the justification, all of those things that we talked about in typography all do matter. Text-based logos, here we go, FedEx, IBM, Coca-Cola, CNN, Disney, and NASA. None of these were pre-existing fonts. Right? The, the graphic designer didn't say, oh, I'm doing the, the, the design for CNN. Let me pull up the CNN font. CNN, all right, my logo's done. They drew that. And they came up with that as a, as, a, as a concept. Disney, same thing. The Y in Disney has always bugged me. It looks like a P. But it just, you know, maybe I'm ruining it for you. right? I can't, I can't look at it and not have it end in a P. It, I don't. Anyway, Disnip, right? But the point is that Disney is an iconic font now. Walt Disney, we recognize that as Disney. And it certainly allows some flexibility. NASA, Coca-Cola, same thing, IBM. Okay, so I have, to, I have to bring this out, okay? So some of you, and if you've already seen this, don't say anything, right? But there's something hidden in the FedEx logo that is extremely well done. Okay, you ready? Boom, mind blown. There's an arrow. So you will never look at the FedEx arrow, arrow logo the same way again. It's subtle things like that. I know, you guys all just fell out of your chairs, I know. <laughs> That's it, we're done. Yeah, we're done. Mic drop. No. The point is that these kinds of little things change. See, I knew I'd get that reaction eventually. These kinds of things change what makes a good logo, right? It's something subtle, it's something unexpected that's in there. FedEx is about moving things from one place to another. You hide the arrow in there. It's in plain sight. Really cool. Very, very well done. And it also means that that logo is going to last. Some of these other ones, Dynamic Dust. Okay, somebody comes up with the name of a company, Dynamic Dust. How on earth do you make a logo for dust? Right? Sometimes it's one of those design challenges, kind of fun. Anyway, that's a made up company as far as I know. I really like this. It's a very clean, you know, this would be like a typeface designer or something. It feels, it feels clean, it feels really well done, the font choice is really well done, and it's subtle. You wanna make sure that you avoid cliches, okay? You can't go into Word and pick clip art and use that as your logo. Okay? It's the number one sign that you're not a professional at whatever you do because you went and grabbed the clip art. It happens all the time for businesses. Don't do it. No cliches, no light bulbs for ideas, no globes for international, right? Those have all been done. If you copy somebody else's logo, it's someone else's logo. And so your brand isn't associated with that logo. You throw a globe up there, everybody has globes up there. It just doesn't work. So you have to think about what makes you unique and different, right? If I did, if I did a logo, oh, this is going to be my logo, and it was you know, something that looked kind of close to the Nike swoosh. Well, guess what? Everybody would look at it and say, well, that looks kind of close to the Nike swoosh. Same thing, right? If I did a logo that was in the Coca-Cola font, it said Grant Adams, everybody would say, well, that's the Coca-Cola font. It doesn't work. So it has to be about you, and it has to be unique. When we get to actually output files, today we're going to be creating a 1500 pixel by 1500 pixel logo. That's kind of a good base. Remember what I talked about last class, though, raster versus vector graphics. We're creating a vector graphic. Therefore, it can scale up or it can scale down, which is great. So we're creating this 1500 by 1500 pixel at 300 DPI for print. These other ones would be for other output formats. If we were going to the web, if we were doing a, a fav icon, if we were, you know, whatever, other uses, PNGs, transparent backgrounds, et cetera. Always save the AI file from Illustrator. That's the original. Illustrator file because then you can go back and scale it up or scale it down depending on how big you need it to be. Think about black and white, grayscale, color. How's your logo changed in those various formats? I'm only asking today for the color version. So I'm not going to ask you for the other formats, but it's worth thinking about because sometimes you want to have 
a black and white or a grayscale version. I've just got a bunch of examples here that I'll throw up. Here's another example from, from sketching phase through the development. Uh, we'll do this little three. They must have been channeling like eBay or something. This must have been the 90s. This, this kind of looks like 90s, actually. You know, I don't know. That's the first edition. No, we need to, to modify it a little bit, thin out the fonts. This feels a little bit better. But what about if we replace one of the letters with the jigsaw puzzle, something like that? And then what does the business card look like long term? OK, so let's look at design trends for this year. I like to throw up some design trends so that you can see what's happening in various. We have the, the ombre, or the, the gradients. Transitions, similar color, working through those transitions, but all in the same color scheme. Circles are also very popular right now. Interlocking circles, circles that overlap, that sort of thing, very popular. The half and half. So we, we divide down the center. One side's a little bit darker than the other side. The links are the interconnected. These are the, the infinite loops, the Mobius strips, the foldings. Dog-eared, clipped corners, rounded corners. The corner itself, square with a diagonal. Dotted lines are apparently very popular. Off-shift. I think this works great for the MoMA, SF MoMA. It's really clear. It's easy to read. When we get down in some of the other ones, like Futurist or IT Formation, I, I can't even read that one because it's too hard to figure out where the breaks and the shifts are. So SF, MoMA, pretty clear. right? There's only three blocks. Like I can see that really e easily. The sharing economy, that works pretty well with the N being shared between the two. Um, but you just want to make sure if you're going to do an off shift that it's readable, that you can see what's happening, and it's clear what you're trying to say. All right, the little curls, the folds, the pocket shield, so this general shape with the triangle at the bottom. I'm going to show you how to make these today. Slices, lots of, lots of parallel slices as part of it. And the letter block. It's kind of like the pocket shield, only it's a square. Benders, these are uh, very much in the same category as some of the other ones that I've showed you. And finally, we have the bars. So lots of parallel bars making up the design. OK, so I'm going to switch over into Illustrator, and we'll go through kind of some of the, the programmatic technical details of creating a logo. So hold on for a second while we switch. OK, so we've switched over. I'm opening up Illustrator. Maybe. And uh, I'm going to encourage you, like I said before, to create multiple versions of logos as you, as you play around with this. And I'm going to do the same as I'm going through it. Um, I don't have these pre-planned out, so they may turn out ugly. I don't know. Um, I'm doing it live just like you're going to be doing it live to, to kind of sort it out. When I go to File and then Create a New Illustrator Document, I want it to be 1,500 pixels by 1,500 pixels. That's my working area. So I'm actually typing in PX. Um, and my units are in pixels. That's fine. You can switch these units to inches if you want later on, but the pixels are, are probably fine for what we're doing. A couple other things here. And we haven't really talked about this just yet. If we're intending this to, and this is next lecture, we're going to talk about this in more depth. If we're intending this to be printed, our color mode should be CMYK, which are the inks that are in um, a printer. My resolution should be at 300 points per inch. And I'll go ahead and say OK. 
And there we go. Now I have this page to start on. Because I'm going to create multiple versions, it's worth working a little bit with our layers. For some reason, my layers window got really big. Um, I'm going to go ahead and rename layer one to be logo one. And then I can create a, a layer for logo two, layer for logo three, et cetera, as I go through and evolve this logo. Sometimes the evolution isn't drastically different. So I might have one version, and I want to make a subtle tweak. I'll copy it onto the next layer and then continue on with it, make a subtle tweak. But I can go back and, and, and work with the particular uh, logo. If I didn't like it, oh, that, that change didn't really work for me, I can go from there. OK. So as I start to create these things, we're going to use a couple tools that we haven't used before, one of which is called the Pathfinder tools. And I can see those by going to Window and then showing Pathfinder. I want to make sure that, oops, that, that is up here, floating there. And I'll talk through what these do in just a second. So first off, let me create a square. So I'll go to my rectangle tools. I don't want there to be a stroke, so no outline. But I do want there to be a fill color. And our, um, our fill color, I'm going to pick arbitrary color. I'm going to pick orange, because it'll be nice and visible on the screen. But you can choose any color you want. Next class is all about color theory, so you can <laughs> change your colors at that point. Um, but I'll go ahead and say OK. And then I can create a square um, by dragging and holding down Shift. Or I could also just single click, and it brings up a rectangle dialog box that says, oh, I want this to be 1,000 pixels by 1,000 pixels, for example. So I can hold down Shift to stay in proportion, or I can do 1,000 by 1,000. Now, also, just because I'm doing a square doesn't mean you have to do a square. I'm just using this as an example. Okay, You guys are going to be creating whatever you want for you. So I have that little square like that. Now let's say that I want to take a piece out of this particular square. Let's say I want to clip the edge, for example. Let me come in, and I'm going to do an ellipse or a circle. And for clarity purposes, I'm going to change the color. And I'll draw a circle. Something like that. Oops. And of course, it changed the color of this one, too. Let's change that back to orange. OK, so I have these two shapes that are working together. What the Pathfinder tools allow you to do is it allows you to do um, operations between two objects. So for example, the first one here is a Unite. So if I were to take both of these objects and press the Unite button in Pathfinder, it would make one object out of the two. So I no longer have this half of the circle. It's now said this whole thing is one big object. Let me back up here. The next option is minus front. So it's going to subtract the object that is in front. My circle is in front. My square is in the back. So if I do minus front, I'll get that cut out of the corner of that particular object. Next one here is give me the intersection of the two objects. So if I click that, it's going to give me just the piece where the two objects intersect. Last object here is get rid of the intersection. So there we go. And it's now created that as a logo. So these Pathfinder tools are really easy ways of assembling shapes together. It's under Window, Pathfinder. Okay. There are also, those are the shape modes. There are also other shape modes here that cut the shape up into multiple pieces. So in this example here, I have both of these selected. If I cut the, use this one, which is divide, it's going to give me three separate pieces. Uh, and I'd have to double click to get inside of the grouped object, but then I can control each of these pieces separately from the others. So it's essentially a way of slicing things up. Uh, this next option here is trim, and I forget what trim does. Ah, yes. So it gives me, it cuts this out and leaves the object that's on top. There we go. Next object, next here is merge. I don't know what merge, yeah, crop, outline, and minus the back. So you're, you're more than welcome to play around with these other options. 
they're, they become less and less common. The most common ones are the shape modes on the top, and then we become less and less common as we go through. You guys can play around with what these, these options do and, and how to work. But I can take this a step further. So let's, let's continue to work with my square here for just a second. Let me go in to my font, or my, my type here, and let me go ahead and type my initials. So we'll say GA. Let me make those bigger. Uh, we're going to have to do maybe, oh, let's try a little bit bigger still. Now remember, I should also pay attention to the font choice itself. So I don't want, you know, do I want it to be Old English, for example? Probably not. Uh, but the point is, you can play around with what, what's the right font, what's the right look. Once you have the one that looks right to you, right? I can come down here. I'm going to have those overlap just a little bit like that. And then I'm going to go to Type, Create Outlines. I did that in Illustrator, same thing. And then I could take these two objects, and I could subtract the object that's in front and end up with just that as part of a logo. So you can see how I can start to, to create these various pieces. So maybe that's my first logo. Yeah, it's OK. Let me move on for a second. I'll create a new layer. We'll call this Logo 2. There we go. Now on Logo 2, I want the same square. So I'll come back here to the rectangle tool. 1,000 by 1,000, there's my same square to work with. But this time, I want it to have the, the shield, uh, the, the triangle that goes down at the bottom here. So I have a couple different options. You guys have worked extensively with the pen tool. I could come into the pen tool. I could add an anchor point right at the center here. I could then use the direct select tool to select just that anchor point, And I could pull that down to create that shape if I wanted to. I could also take a, a rectangle here, and then I could rotate that rectangle using the free transform and make it overlap. until it overlapped. Of course, I'm struggling to make it actually work here. Sometimes the arrow keys on your keyboard are your best friends to get it precisely right. And then I could use the same Pathfinder tools to, to create the bottom half. So there's multiple ways of, of getting to your particular shape. Um, let me go back here. I don't quite have enough space for that. So let me come back to the Add Anchor Point. Oh, I already have the Anchor Point. Perfect. Take that anchor point, and I'm going to pull this one down a little bit to create that part. Now, maybe I want to cut this in half so that I can color one side darker than the other. That was one of the trends. I could do that using the rectangle tool. I can make a rectangle that's larger on one side. And I could say, let's take these two pieces. And using Pathfinder, let's. Um, Hold on, it's this one. Let's break them all apart. They are a group when you do that, so I'm going to just ungroup them so I can work at them as individual objects. There's one object. There's the second object. We'll get rid of that piece. There we go. So there's one. There's the other. I could take one side of this, and I could darken that just a little bit, like that, to create the half. And then I could put. You know, the logo on the center, so maybe I'll go back to having a G on it, for example. And maybe it needs to be a little bit bigger. Let's go to maybe 800 or 900. Remember to create outlines from this. So I'll go to Objects, Create Outlines. Excuse me, type, create outline. There we go. And then I could take these two or these three objects and I could subtract what's in front. Oh, 
I might have to have two versions of it. Let me copy and then paste in place. Puts a second copy in the same place. I can then take this and this and do a subtraction. And I could do this and this and do a subtraction. And then I end up with the two halves of that. So you guys see how the Pathfinder can make it really fast to subtract or add to a particular sh uh, shape. So let's see what else. Um, let's say that instead I wanted a series of parallel lines here. Um, I could take and draw a bar. Let's make it a little bit bigger here. Let me change the color just so this is a little bit more obvious. There we go. And I'm going to create a bunch of these. So control C, control V. Uh, it's, it's, yeah, it's, see that green line? It's trying to give me a, an approximation. I'm not overly worried about the spacing just yet. I'm just trying to get all of them in here. And I'll show you how I'll solve the spacing in just a second. Let me take all of these, Control-C, Control-V to get a second set. And I'll drop those over. Make those two go away. And then I'm going to concentrate on this one and this one, making sure that they're even. And I can either do this visually, or I could use my align tools. So there to there seems about even. I'm going to select all of these objects, and I'm going to go to View, or excuse me, Window, and I'm going to go to Align. This should look very similar to what was happening in, um, in, uh, in Design. Thank you. Uh, and I can distribute the ob objects horizontally, distribute center, which is going to make all the spacing even between them, which is, which is the point. I'm going to go ahead and make these objects a compound path. So I'll go to Object, Compound Path. Actually, I need half of them as a compound path, sorry, because I'm going to do this in two separate operations. I'm going to go to Object, Compound Path, Make. You guys did this in InDesign as well when we had those two frames and we wanted them to become one frame. I'm going to do the same thing. So that becomes one object. This becomes another object. So if I click on them, they're selecting all of them. Then I could take this and this and do the same subtract. So let me go back to Pathfinder, and we'll subtract. Oops. Let me see here. I might have to do this as a, let's see, trim will work. I think trim works. Take these. No. See, I told you when, you, when you do these live, sometimes they don't work exactly as you want. Give me just a second and see. Yeah, so I did do it. I just have to go into my group and then get rid of them. So the trim did make it. I just had to double, ch double click to get inside of my group to then modify those particular stripes. You had a question. Layers aren't quite the same in Illustrator as in Photoshop. The, the, they work the same in the, the sense that whatever's on top shows up above something else. But the difference between Illustrator and InDesign layers work the same. Photoshop layers, you can only have one object on a layer. So in, in InDesign and in Illustrator, um, if I were to open up this layer and expand it, you can see all of the objects that are on this layer, and there can be a lot of them. Um, and so that's, that's a fundamental difference between the two. So I have this with the stripes. Let me come back. If I, if I do the same thing here, if I take these two pieces, and I um, let me go back to my Pathfinder, and I was going to divide, I think. I'm going to go into the group here, and I'll get rid of these pieces. Well, because I picked divide, it's making it more challenging for me to select these. But you guys get the idea, certainly. Sure. 
Almost there. So this actually brings out a good point that I should, have, I should have shown you before. If I click on one of the blues, instead of clicking on all of them, I should have done this from the beginning, I can go up to the Select menu and say Select Same Fill Color, and it'll select all those that are that color. And then I could press the Delete key. It would make my life easier. <laughs> so then I can go back out and I can say, OK, is that, is that doing what I want it to do? It's probably a little too busy. So I would ask one of my neighbors, hey, what do you think of this? And they might say, nah, it's not quite right. The point is, though, that you're evolving and you're changing. Now, maybe the next version would have a gradient where each of these colors would change as it went across. I don't know. You have to play around with it. So the, the goal today is to work with the Pathfinder tool to create a variety of different logos and decide which one feels right for you and for your particular design okay, and your, your particular um, background. Ask your neighbor what they think. Make some modifications. You're going to end the day with a final version of your uh, logo. Now, when you do your export, so if I go to File and then Save for Web, it is important to pay attention to what your output is, whether it's a PNG or whether it's a JPEG, because the PNG will keep the background transparent. The JPEG will place white into the background. And so depending on your intended purpose long term, you may want to have a white background. You may want to have it transparent so that it can go on anything. So be aware of that uh, before you do your save as to what you're picking. My guess is you're going to want a PNG. But that's up to you. OK? Are there any questions about what we're doing today? No? All right. The, my initial rectangle was just a big block of color that I started slicing up. Can, yeah, logos really don't tend to have pictures in them. They're more graphic. They're more iconic than anything else. You could, you could find pictures that are kind of a basis for what you want and then trace over them or make shapes from them and evolve them into a logo. There's nothing wrong with that. But it shouldn't really have an actual logo in it or it shouldn't really have an actual picture in it. Okay.